Well, welcome everybody. Um, how many people have been here before? Everybody's just a few people. So, um, well, good. We have some new people. Um, I'm Barbara Peterson, and I'm the program director for sciences and mathematics at UC Berkeley Extension. And um, I'm really excited about this lecture. <laughs> I think it's a topic that um, many of us are very interested in, very timely, um, very cutting edge. And um, so I've been looking forward to this. What I'm going to do before I introduce um, John Gelbard is give you an overview of extension. And also, given the topic, I'm going to talk to you about what types of things we cover in sustainability at extension. And um, a lot of literature is on the table. So you're welcome to look at that. All that information is on the web. So if you don't want to take any paper with you, I certainly understand that all of that's on the web. Um, my business cards are here, so you can um, ask questions. And um, you can take my card and ask questions. I don't actually manage the entire sustainability portfolio. We're pretty interdisciplinary, but we're a small organization, so I can find out who could answer your questions. So go ahead and take those. And I will be around at the end to answer questions. I also, because I'm the science um, director, there's other information about the science programs that we have at Extension. Um, we have catalogs out front, so if you want to grab that and get a, an overview of other things, go ahead and do that before you leave. But, but mostly just welcome. Um, um, UC Berkeley Extension, we're the continuing education arm of UC Berkeley. We've been around for over 100 years. Um, we have lots of different programs, classes, professional certificates, um, specialized programs of study. We work with corporate clients. We have business programs. We have international students here. We have lots of online courses for distance learners. Um, we have some... Um, high school students that we offer college uh, preparation programs for. So we, lots of different types of students. Um, for the most part, though, we have, our students are working adults. They're professionals. Um, they're very focused, engaged, motivated. They're a really great group to teach. I taught biology for a couple of years here, and it was really a delight, and I miss it. I'm just a little busy at this point. Um, many career changers, uh, career advancers are taking courses at UC Berkeley Extension. We have lots of evening and weekend courses, because most of our students are working full-time or part-time during the day. And so that's really where most of our courses are scheduled. Um, we have some lifelong learners who are here, some um, personal enrichment seekers. Um, so we have a pretty diverse classroom. 92% um, of our students have a bachelor's degree. Uh, 38 have also have a graduate degree. So it's a pretty well-educated group. Um, I've had um, some of my instructors come back and say, you know, I didn't realize when I was going to teach molecular biology that everybody in the class would have a PhD. And <laughs> so it was a slightly different class, but they were engineers. They were all sorts of other things, but um, a really fun class to teach. Um, we teach courses in art and design, um, health sciences, biotechnology, business, computer science, engineering, humanities, writing, uh, teacher training, sustainability studies. And I think that's probably what brought a lot of you here this evening. Um, we have classes here. We have classes on the Berkeley campus in the evening. We have two classrooms in San Francisco, two buildings in San Francisco. We also have a center that just opened in Belmont. Previously, we were in Redwood City, and we've moved to a new site right off the freeway. Doesn't have the signage up yet, but we're um, uh, very convenient. Um, we, and as I mentioned, we have lots of online courses. We offer about 1,500 courses annually. We're one of the bigger extensions in California of the UC system. Um, we have about um, 30,000 enrollments annually. And um, we have um, about um, 20 to 30 um, certificate programs that we offer. So again, all of that's on our website. It's pretty navigable. And um, you can also take my card, and I can answer questions afterwards. So that's what um, Extension looks like. Now, sustainability studies at Extension is, not surprisingly, an interdisciplinary 
program, so it helps um, to sort of explain the different departments that we're in and certainly contact us with questions. Our website's pretty good about directing you to the appropriate people. Um, we have a group in sustainable design, so landscape architecture, architecture, and, and that overlaps with some of the other groups. We have in our engineering group, we have a sustainable systems um, um, series of courses and programs, and then um, for me, as the director of science um, and mathematics, I have a new certificate program in the essentials of green chemistry. There's information about that over here. Um, that's what I'm really excited about is there's also a, a program on the Berkeley campus, a new center for green chemistry, and we um, interact with them. They're training matriculated students. We're training professional students here. And I wanted to just let you know, there's a flyer there, but there's a conference next week on the campus um, that's going to be really interesting. It's sold out, but they webcast everything. So you can watch it live. I think you can probably ans ask questions live, and then eventually they archive it. There's going to be some great speakers. So if that's a topic that's of interest, um, make sure you um, follow that and look that up at some point. Um, we have courses in, um, along with green chemistry, uh, smart grid technology, solar energy, green building, sustainability in energy, sustainability in transportation, um, sustainable design, corporate social responsibility reporting, uh, responsible global change management. These are all sort of series of courses that we offer. And we also have a, a, a series in leadership and sustainability and environmental management. So you can certainly, um, many of our students come here and sign up for an entire series so they actually get a professional certificate, but you're also welcome just to take individual classes. And um, that's completely up to you. A couple of classes coming up. Um, in the green chemistry um, area, we have a business and financial planning for green chemistry innovation that starts on March 26th. And um, more information over there. And then we have another great course on the principles of green purchasing and sustainability. And the instructor for that is our um, speaker for tonight. So I'm sure he will touch on that. Um, during the talk this evening. So let me move on to introducing our speaker, um, John Gelbart. Um, he's a, um, will be speaking this evening on advancing the green economy. He's a conservation scientist. He has a, a BS in natural resources from Cornell University, a master's in environmental management from Duke University, and a PhD in ecology from the University of California, Davis. He has done lots of different things. I'll just give you a couple of highlights. Um, he's taught at the World Wild Wildlife Fund's climate camp workshops. He's appeared in the urban forest documentary, Dig It, which hopefully will come out soon. Um, he's also uh, the producer for some of the largest green music festivals. So he has a pretty varied career. Currently, um, he's the founder and director of CVI, Conservation Value Institute. This is a nonprofit organization that builds bridges between uh, conservation scientists and the public. And in addition to that, most importantly, he's an instructor at UC Berkeley Extension. And as I mentioned, he has a course that starts in a few weeks, Principles of Green Purchasing and Sustainability. So I think you'll find out more about this tonight. You can also probably ask some questions at the end. And as I mentioned, I will be around answering questions too at the end about anything related to sustainability and sciences that I can um, help you with. So um, let's welcome John Gelbard. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thank you very much, Barbara. You're welcome. So Barbara had mentioned that I worked with some, some music festivals. I work with people in business, NGOs, and especially when working with, with, with folks in the music industry, working with green businesses as well. As a scientist, I've gotten a lot of questions. What's really green? Is it really green? Does it really make a difference? And this course, which is briefly summarized in this lecture, is the product of a lot of research that I've done to address this question of what's really green? Does it really make a difference? Does it really have an impact when you make a decision in the office? 
all the way out that reverberates outward to benefit the health of the ecosystem and to benefit ourselves. What I have found is, is that there are profound benefits of green products and services. There are financial benefits, energy security benefits, health benefits, profound health benefits. But at the same time, there is so much green lingo out there that it can become extremely overwhelming to kind of sort through this jungle of green claims out there and identify which products you can choose to really have an impact that reverberates out from the office to the, eco to the ecosystem. And I'm going to argue that this level of trust that we know that when we buy something, it's really going to make a difference. It's going to provide real, measurable, verifiable impact is key to advancing the green economy and getting people to do these things. Now, why does green purchasing matter? This question is the first of what I'm going to propose is what I call four key questions to evaluate any green purchase. And the questions are, number one, why does green purchasing matter in general and in this category? The second question is, what's really green in general? And in this purchasing category, what does the science, what do the latest technical specifications really say about the benefits and impacts of green in this category compared to a, a, a non-green counterpart? The third question to ask in this framework is how can you prove it? How can I verify that you're telling the truth? And that's where you look to certifications, for example. And the fourth question is, in such a rapidly evolving and new uh, field, what else do we need to do to solidify and improve the system so that we can build trust in the true impacts of green products and know that we're really helping to solve some of the problems that I'm about to talk about. And why does green purchasing matter? And, and I'm going to start with the story of planetary boundaries. Last year, the journal Nature published an article by a bunch of a pretty impressive all-star team of authors saying that the, that the Earth is approaching a whole bunch of planetary boundaries that if we surpass them, uh, the more that we surpass, the more uncertainty we're going to give to humanity as far as our well-being. And they include everything from climate change, ocean acidification, um, land use change, chemi toxic chemical pollution, biodiversity loss, you name it. Climate change, of course, is happening. And I can tell you, as, as a scientist who's been following this since the early 1990s, faster than anybody could have imagined. Things that people had, had told me, that my professors told me were going to happen in 50 to 100 years, are happening in 15. And so we see pictures like this of glaciers from just a few decades ago that are now gone. This is happening now, folks. What does it mean to you and me? We saw the effects of Hurricane Katrina. More, the prediction is as, as the Earth warms, more moisture in the atmosphere, we get more severe weather, more floods and storms, predictions of sea level rise. The areas in blue in New York City could well be underwater by the end of the century. Who's going to pay for the seawalls? How much is that going to cost? A million dollars a mile, from what I understand. Climate change is also predicted to, uh, through this flooding, to cause increased uh, instability, food shortages, as we see with the, with the flooding in Australia, it's affected their wheat crops and other crops. Agricultural prices uh, are a bit nutty right now after the droughts in Siberia this summer and the drought in China that are affecting their, their wheat crops in particular, as well as um, the floods in Australia and Pakistan around the world. So this is a very serious issue. Droughts as well. It's a security issue. It's a health issue. Our products, our inefficient products, are helping cause this problem. 
<coughs> our use of fossil fuels, inefficient use of energy. Fortunately, there are solutions, clean energy, organic agriculture. We'll talk about these today. Another reason why green purchasing is extremely important is we're coming up with peak oil, or really peak everything right now, the end of cheap oil, and what I call a phenomenon called the, the petroleum ceiling on our economy, where oil demand is so tight around the world that every time the economy starts to rebound, oil prices go up, which kind of puts a cap on the economy. How can we break through this petroleum ceiling on our economy through green purchasing, clean energy, energy efficient products that reduce our demand on oil? So for the rest of the lecture, I'm going to work through this framework. I'm going to talk a little generally about what is a green product. Then for those of you who have seen the Bay Area green business stickers around town, we'll talk about what's a green business. You'll know what those stickers mean the next time you see them. Then we're going to take, use the framework to take a closer look at energy efficient products, food products, and forest products. And then I'm going to give you a couple of little teaser previews for purchasing for protection from toxic chemicals and to eliminate waste and achieve zero waste goals. And then I'll provide some more course details at the end. So what's really green? in terms of green products and services. We have all sorts of eco-labels, I'm green, I'm green because of this or because of that. But what does it really mean on the ground in terms of real, measurable, verifiable impact? How does, when I, when I want to know what's really green, what we're really asking is how does it reduce emissions of heat trapping carbon pollution, not contribute to deforestation and biodiversity loss? How is it safe and non-toxic for ecosystems in my body? And of course, how can you prove it? And as far as what is a green product? It can have a sustainable production impact, a sustainable use impact, safe, energy resource efficient, or a sustainable end of life disposal impact. It's not going to end up in a landfill. If it does end up in a landfill, it's not going to leach toxic pollutants. So compared to its non-green counterparts, a sustainable production impact might mean that it's sustainably grown crops or extracted raw materials, organic food, sustainably harvested wood, recycled product materials, recycled metals, plastics, wood, paper. You're using something recycled. That means that we don't have to cause forest destruction, mining damage, use more oil out of the ground, and so forth to, to use those materials. Um, it also could mean that the energy used to ex extract and ship the product should be sustainable. Um, sustainable levels of water are required for its production. How about sustainable use? If it's safe to use, you want this in your house around your baby, your kid. For example, I know that this is, this is a particular category that my wife and I, with an 18-month-old daughter, um, have looked quite a bit at. A product that is safe and efficient to use. It prevents or reduces um, pollution of our air, land, water, or ourselves. It offers business benefits, cost savings, health, protect health protection, safety, reduced business risks. You're not going to get sued. Um, Increased employee morale and productivity uses energy, water, or other resources more efficiently. And then there's sustainable end of life reuse impact. As I said, it doesn't end up in a landfill. If it does, it won't leach toxins. If it's biodegradable, or it claims to be biodegradable, it should be disposed of somewhere that it will actually degrade. There's a lot of biodegradable claims out there. There's a for marketing claims, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, has green guides that specify the language that you should use. And if you don't use, you could be subject to a lawsuit. If you claim, for example, that a product is biodegradable, but it won't actually degrade under conditions of what they call customary disposal, which is usually a landfill within one year, then you can't call it biodegradable without a risk of getting sued. Same thing with recyclable. So a mattress could claim that it's recyclable, 
But, but do you know of anywhere around here that you can recycle a mattress? If you don't, then if, if there's not an actual mattress recycling facility here, the FTC says you really can't claim that the mattress is recyclable. There has to be somewhere that you can actually recycle it in a reasonable distance if you're going to claim just generally that something is recyclable. So that's what, the claim, that's what it has to be mean. And all this stuff can be confusing. What if a product with a sustainable use impact um, does not have a sustainable, like a solar panel or a hybrid vehicle, does not have a sustainable production impact? It takes a, a lot of dirty energy to manufacture it, or if it causes toxic pollution, or a sustainable disposal impact. If it's toxic and sustainable disposable options have not yet emerged. So the trend here is to use an approach called life cycle analysis to look at the entire life cycle of a product and help key in on the relevance of a green claim. Where in the product's life cycle is its biggest impact? And then you can prioritize your purchasing choices. So in the case of a vehicle, for example, um, is a gas guzzling Hummer with soy foam seats green? You know, no, what you're looking for is you're looking for fuel efficiency in, in that area. So that's, so as far as life cycle impact and purchasing choices, the important thing is to, is to key in on the life cycle stage of the greatest impact and how you can reduce that specific impact. And that's where life cycle analysis comes in very useful for, um, for making sure the relevant life stage of greatest impact of a product is green. So what's a green service? The green business is a service. Must provide its value to its customers with the least amount of environmental impact, not just in the execution of the actual service, but also in the purpose it serves to customers. You know, so it's, we're a green assassin. <laughs> um, I use recycled lead bullets. You know, that's not exactly green. Examples of, real to of green services could include low on toxic materials use. A cleaning service, for example, uses uh, environmentally friendly cleaners. As close to climate neutral as possible, an office that's located in a solar powered office building. Certified as a green business, and we'll, and we'll talk more about this, as I said, shortly. Now, how can you prove it? There's a lot of different certifications in a lot of different categories. Each purchasing category has good certifications that you can trust, that you know that if you see that label, that, it, that you can trust it to provide the impacts and the benefits that it claims. And some of them have bad certifications that are kind of bull crap, that don't really mean that the product is sustainable in that category. And we'll talk about a couple of these today. We'll, we'll get into more detail about that in the course so you know what's, what the real deal is. What's a good eco-label? It's industry specific, really has expertise related to food, related to forestry. That helps really hone in on science-based, top-level technical standards to, to meet. It's accurate, it's consistent, it's clear for people. It's independent, third-party verified, and free from conflict of interest. Meaningful, you understand, you get it. OK, I can see what that means. It's transparent. The standards are publicly available. If you want to see what that little happy face means, you can actually get online and, and, and look it up. It's collaborative. It's developed with public and industry input. And that really helps make things work well. And it's a marketing access. It's got a memorable name, a recognizable logo. It's easy for people to get, for people to remember, for people to actually see what it means. Because I mean, how many of you have been confused? Like, what does that mean? Does that really mean anything? It's important that these things be memorable and recognizable, or else they just won't catch on with the public. The EPA also has some standards for a good eco label that I wanted to add in here. A good system of data verification that you, people look, people measure the impact. It updates the standard as the technology and the science advance that the organization issuing the eco-label uh, has the authority to just come in and do some random inspections. Very, very important. Otherwise, you can get a lot of chicanery. 
um, testing. The, te the products are tested at a credible institution. You don't just kind of have a test sent in to you know, done by your by your uncle and send it in. Up, oh, it's okay. Everything's good. That it's independent. It's a good testing institute. And also that these are accessible to smaller companies. In a lot of cases, the best eco labels have one of the problems that smaller organizations face is that is that they're expensive. And they might have a really good product, but they can't get the top certification in their business category because they're a new, small, growing business. And also compliance with FTC green guides at marketing. Like I mentioned, the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, is very specific about what you can and can't say as far as marketing and claiming that, that it's green. What types of certifications do you have? Um, federal, state, and local. Um, programs, statutes, um, and also uh, there's environmentally preferable purchasing programs in addition to certifications at the government level. San Francisco, you go to their website, they have sfapproved.org, for example, and that means that they have vetted these products and they think that they're good. The state has one of these, the EPA has one of these as well. There's independent third party certifications like I've talked about, and then there's industry certifications. So the bottom line here with what's really green is to avoid products and services if the claims are vague, not verified, not properly certified. Look for products with claims that are specific and truthful. Why is it green? What benefits does it provide? Transparent and verifiable, they've proved it. The claimed benefits and positive impacts are measurable and verifiable via third party certification. And they're also relevant and meaningful. It's not a Hummer with tires made out of organic rubber. And there's a bunch of different resources. Goodguide.com is another one for seeing what's really green. SF approved, as I just mentioned, California. And in each purchasing category, each week of this, of this class, there will be a slew of resources that, that come with it. So now the next question, what is a green business? You've seen this little Bay Area green business sticker. What does it mean? But what is a green business in general? And according to Gil Friend, sustainable business expert, he says green could mean that a business reduces environmental impacts by our purchasing choices, like we're talking about here, that it complies with environmental regulations has a sick, slick green marketing campaign, publishes a corporate sustainability report. This is what we're doing. CSR reporting, this is what we've done. It documents it, tracks it. Has good environmental management systems, is, is otherwise green certified. But his personal de definition, and this is from his book, The Truth About Green Business, is a business that makes sense not only for owners and employees, but also for living systems. You're not trashing a forest. It operates lean, clean, and green, uses green to build profit and advantage and reduce risk. We'll look at specific examples of that. Prospers by embedding the laws of nature, uses biomimicry to inspire a successful product, for example, or creates products that are biodegradable. In, in waste, there is no, in nature, there is no such thing as waste. Waste is, a, for, is always something else's food. A leaf falls to the ground. It becomes food for microbes and insects and so on and so forth. How can product designers think about uh, designing a product to reflect that paradigm? It doesn't just focus on environmental considerations. also looks at social, triple bottom line, economic, social, environmental, um, and also considers partners, environmental legacies, where they donate your green business. Do you want to partner with the Kochs, for example, who, if you disagree with, the, with their politics, um, and they are supporting some extremely environmentally damaging initiatives like the oil sands up in Canada, that's another consideration about being a green business. So Gil calls this a green an organizing principle of of business. Um, other principles, design with nature, adhere to nature's principles, buy the right stuff from suppliers, 
vet your suppliers, make sure they use certifications. They use eco-friendly practices. Um, what you realize, what you can realize, if you take these types of steps, is that you can build operating margins by eliminating waste, boost profits, reduce resource use, build revenue, um, making customers happy, making fans they tell their friends about you, reduce risk by eliminating hazards, toxic chemicals in the workplace, something spills, all, something happens if, if, if your product is faulty, it's toxic. Uh, uses measures that matter to actually track positive impact, very important. Um, get ahead of regulatory frameworks. You don't have to worry about regulations if you're a green business for the most part, because there's a good chance that you're meeting them. Enhances your standing among stakeholders, incorporates environmental concerns in your workplace, differentiates your products, and builds a positive brand image. What, what do you need to do as a business to do that? And the first step would be to conduct an eco audit. Examine your products and services for maximum impact. Take a look at what you use. Put the data to work, prioritizing and executing opportunities. It's also big companies that do this in big ways. Patagonia tracks the social and environmental impacts of its products. Seventh generation reveals all of its ingredients to its customers, building loyalty. Another way to gain these benefits is to leverage a green business program like the Bay Area Green Business Program. They provide guidance, checklists to follow, um, certification by completing these checklists, and also marketing benefits. There's a bunch of different ones. There's government programs like this. There's also independent and industry programs. The Bay Area Green Business Program operates at the county level. If you're in Berkeley, you'd want the Alameda County Green Business Program. If you are in, Contra, in El Cerrito, Contra Costa County, and so forth, they offer product industry-specific checklists. The checklists are different whether you're in office, or retail, or restaurant. They have a checklist for you. They even have them for dentists. They have them for auto shops. <laughs> they, according to this program, the definition of a green business is an environmental leader, operates efficiently, completes these checklists, improves employee morale, health, productivity, gives you a marketing edge over the competition. People like to work with green businesses. Some of the checklists of actions to qualify, what do you actually do? What does it actually mean when you see that sticker on the window of a store around Berkeley or Oakland or San Francisco? It means that they're tracking their water quality and energy usage. They've adopted a green purchasing policy. Staff from PG&E or in the water company have visited to verify that you're doing what you claim. Um, you're reducing waste. You're buying only recycled content paper. You're copying double-sided. It's pollution prevention. You're cleaning with less toxic or non-toxic products. You're using energy efficient lighting and other appliances. Low flow toilets, faucet aerators. You're offering employees incentives to do stuff like this at home and to find other solutions in the office. Telling customers, marketing, both to advance your business and also to set a good example. Assisting other businesses to learn. So that's what this means. What's the reward? There's a lot of marketing benefits for becoming a Bay Area green business. Recognition through their website, all sorts of different recognition, press coverage, window decals, green business logo, promotion. Um, now, in the course, we also look at a lot of other approaches to vetting green businesses. There's a, there's, a, there's a book called The Better World Shopping Guide. Have any of you seen that before? Better World Shopping Guide. It's authored by a UC Davis professor in social responsibility that actually grades companies based on environmental and social responsibility. What are the best? What are the worst? We actually have some fun with this in the course in week three, so you'll get to know in your various purchasing categories, what, are, what get good grades, what don't. The Natural Step Framework offers four system conditions for being a green business. We explore that in the course as well. UL 880, that's Underwriting Labs, is a brand new 
certification of sustainability for manufacturing organizations that's been put together by the GreenBiz group, the people who do GreenBiz.com, as well as Underwriting Labs. And it's probably the most comprehensive standard I've ever seen. You have to jump through so many hoops to actually get this standard. It's, it's, it's incredible. And I can't wait to see who actually does it. We'll talk quite a bit about this in the course as well. And we'll talk about Walmart's supplier sustainability assessment. This is, this, is, this is very interesting, because it's a new example of an emerging reality that Walmart is requiring its suppliers to essentially be green to sell your company's products to them. And other stores are starting to do this as well. Other companies, Procter & Gamble, are, are doing this type of thing as well. And as Walmart said, the fastest, the biggest, fastest, and most economical greenhouse gas reductions are not at the retail level. It's not by what we do at our stores necessarily, but rather up and down the value chain of consumer products and raw materials extraction, the impacts of their suppliers and logging, mining, product manufacturing, how, how polluting the factories are, transportation, customer use, or product end of life. And Walmart, um, they actually sent their suppliers these questions, these surveys, it's a supplier sustainability assessment um, in four categories, energy and climate, asking suppliers about the steps that they're taking to reduce energy costs and greenhouse gas emissions, the steps that they're taking to reduce waste and enhance quality, the steps that they're taking to protect natural resources and people and communities. And they claim that they're going to really start shutting people out who don't do these things as far as their suppliers. The good news about being a green business is that if you take the steps to become a certified green business, when big retailers like Walmart do things like this, you're going to be prepared. You're going to have a jump on the competition. And you're going to be ready to jump right in there and capitalize on this opportunity. If they ban PBDEs and you're already a green business, you're probably not going to be using those types of toxic flame retardants. You could say, OK, great. We'll sell you our stuff. And you might be able to knock your competitor off their shelves. So being a green business really matters in, in, in a very good way. Now we're going to take a look at applying this green purchasing framework to a few specific categories of green products. And we're going to start with um, energy efficient products to be specific. Now, key question, one, if you remember from our green purchasing framework, is what is the problem? Why do we, what is the problem that we're solving by purchasing green in this in this category. And in this case, our use of dirty and energy inefficient products is pushing us toward or past multiple planetary boundaries, as we talked about before. Climate change, ocean acidification, aerosol pollution. When I say aerosol pollution, that refers to things like particulates come out of cars, um, nitrogen and sulfur dioxide pollution, uh, toxic chemical pollution, especially mercury which comes out of burn, uh, coal burning power plants, for example, um, and coal fly ash waste. And I say, see also deep water horizon here because of all the toxic chemicals that are used as disper dispersants of, in oil spills and, and, and biodiversity. Climate change is having impacts in biodiversity, land use, changing fire regimes, insect outbreaks, and so on and so forth. Um, there's the economic health and security ramifications of energy inefficient products. Peak oil on the petroleum ceiling. If you have a more efficient vehicle, if you use more energy efficient appliances, you have a more energy efficient building, you're going to be less impacted by energy uncertainties in the energy industry. The hidden costs of dirty energy. The National Academies of Sciences last year came out with a report saying that dirty energy, especially from coal and oil burning, generates $120 billion a year in health costs alone. So it would seem like a good way to, to bring down our health care costs and health insurance premiums is to, is to transform to clean energy. That? that was the National Academies of Sciences. The Hidden Costs of Energy is the name of the report. Oil wars and foreign policy, we all know that story. And business uncertainties. Uh, as if, if, you're, if you're really addicted to, to oil, 
um, who, knows, who knows what the price of my materials are going to be. It's, it's hard to plan. Cuts in the profits. Buildings are also part of the problem. They're responsible for 48% of all energy consumption and heat trapping carbon pollution in the US. Look across the bay at San Francisco on your way home. How many of those lights that you see on do you think that there's actually somebody in the room? Um, so what's the solution? What are the real benefits of green purchasing in this category? We'll start with this building, real big product. Lockheed built a state-of-the-art energy-efficient building in Sunnyvale in 1983. They incorporated natural lighting, provided a constant supply of fresh air, had all sorts of energy and water-efficient um, appliances and features. And as they expected, they saved about $500,000 per year on energy. What they didn't expect was another benefit that they found was that with all this fresh air and more sunlight, people were no, no longer in white-walled cubicles going bonkers during the day. And absenteeism dropped 15%. Workers were 15% more productive than before. And in this particular case study, those economic benefits from that second um, benefit here actually paid for the efficiency upgrades in themselves. So an unplanned force. So this turned out to be a big winner. So what are other energy efficient uh, products and services in addition to buildings? You would also want to buy energy efficient in heating, ventilation, and cooling systems. You see HVAC, that's what that means, heating, ventilation, and cooling. Appliances, lighting, office equipment, vehicles, what does efficient mean? When people say energy efficient, oh, it's efficient. What does that mean? Generally, it means different things in different product categories. So 80 to 90% when people talk about efficient lighting, it's 80, 80 to 90% more efficient than, uh, especially now with LEDs up in the 90% level, than incandescent bulbs. For appliances, it tends to be more in the 20 to 50% range as of now, and hopefully that, that will get better. Um, what are energy efficient services? Evaluating the efficiency of buildings. Implementing efficiency retrofits. Optimizing operation of equipment and facilities. And it can have a huge, huge impact. Last year, the Proceedings of Natu the National Academies of Sciences came out with a paper called Behavioral Wedges. And they, and, and they basically said that if households alone used energy efficient products, the reductions in emissions and corresponding savings of energy and money would be absolutely huge. And they had this graph where basically what this means is that the, re that the potential emissions reductions are in the green. And what they call reasonably achievable are in the red. And what the reasonably achievable means what people are actually likely to do. And that's why the paper is called Behavioral Wedges, because it accounts for the behavioral likelihood that people will actually do this stuff. And, th and they found that the greatest impact at the individual levels would be having fuel efficient vehicles, weatherization, the home, energy efficiency, efficient appliances, and HVAC, driving behavior. Next time you're driving home and you feel a little road rage coming on, know that you can make a difference if you just calm down. <laughs> okay, Keeping your tires aerated, carpooling, um, but these are all steps. The numbers that came out of this were, were very impressive as far as having a real impact through energy efficient uh, purchasing. Um, buildings, the largest savings are in weatherization, uh, using HVAC, water heating, lighting, electronic appliances. Architecture 2030, <coughs> a group came out with a study uh, recently that they said that investment of $21 billion in these types of technologies, in efficient technologies, would produce 216,000 permanent jobs, save a huge amount of heat trapping carbon pollution per year. And the same amount for five years would, would net over a million permanent jobs and save an even huger amount of heat trapping carbon pollution per year. And the best part of all, 
is that a lot of this building and contracting that is required to upgrade efficiency is local. You can't outsource it. So the money that's being spent actually stays in what they said cycles through these local economies several times. So if we want to grow our economy, invest in this, and we'll see tremendous returns um, for growth. Some other numbers, this is from California. Um, if every California household upgraded to, and this is just upgrades to natural gas appliances, more efficient, uh, to Energy Star qualified appliances, um, just from natural gas furnaces, a lot of CO carbon dioxide heat trapping avoided, savings of $230 million a year. Um, gas and water heaters, $91 million a year. Energy efficient dishwashers, $52 million. It's saving heat trapping, carbon pollution, it's saving money. All of that is money that would now be going to PG&E or, or Southern California Edison that if people would do this stuff, it would be people would have it to spend on electronics, clothing, restaurants, travel, you name it. This is stuff for broad economic growth. You can really have an impact through green purchasing in this category. How can you prove it? Government certifications like Energy Star, um, like we've talked about, LEED is the US Green Building Council. They certify green buildings. They have an energy and atmosphere section. Um, EPEAT, they are who to look for for electronics. Uh, EPEAT, in their first 18 months of the program, they come out, they, they had, they have, they've registered a lot of products. And one of the requirements is Energy Star certification of EPEAT certified electronics. They came out with these huge numbers as far as impact that these products, in two, as of 2007, save, you know, enough energy to power 3.7 million homes a year, um, enough reduction of heat trapping carbon emissions equivalent to removing 2.6 million cars. The stuff makes a difference. Looking at another specific example, the building in, in Michigan got lead gold, no incremental cost. It uses 31% less water, 29% less energy, savings more than a million dollars in their pocket from this, uh, from, from, from choosing green. Tide cold water. They did a life cycle analysis. I talked about this for, before to figure out where the greatest environmental impacts of their products were. They found that it was actually in the heating of the water and people using warm and hot, hot washes. And they said that if everybody used this cold water detergent, Every household in the U.S. converted to it would see a 3% reduction in total home energy use, 90 gazillion kilowatt hours, <laughs> and estimated that it would eliminate quite a bit of our annual um, carbon pollution. What else do we need to do? What are the common problems that we experience in this area? Um, People buy efficient uh, products but don't realize the benefits if there's installment or operator error. Problem with buildings, if people don't operate them properly. The wrong, there's stories of people installing the wrong size boiler in their building. Um, lack of oversight and enforcement of Energy Star. People looking the other way, oh yeah, OK, that's certified, sure. Um, like everything else, you can have the best standards in the world, but if they're not enforced, it's not necessarily really going to be green. Uh, LEED had some problems with their point system where you could get LEED gold certification by doing things like having chemical free landscaping and, and Forest Stewardship Council certified wood, but you didn't have to do the energy stuff. They fixed that recently. There's a little controversy called Javon's paradox that some people say energy efficiency, well, if, if it uses less energy, I'll just use it more. That's going back and forth. The balance of experts on this seem to agree that the effect is, is negligible. There was a little hubbub about it recently. There was an article in the New Yorker in January that was countered by uh, Amory Lovins of the Rocky Mountain Institute. Um, if you Google Javon's paradox, you, could, you can find it. It's a, it's a fun little thing. In the course, we also talk about clean transport. In the course, we will get to um, clean energy technology, smart grids, selecting a sustainable city, RECs and offsets, can they really make a credible difference? And shipping, it's a choice that you can make. People are doing innovative things even with shipping. 
that reduce carbon footprint and save money. This is one of my clients. Their mattresses are, are foam. They're soy foam. They ship compressed. They fit in these little boxes. So you can fit three times as many of these mattresses into a truck or a shipping container as regular mattresses. It cuts costs. It reduces heat trapping, carbon pollution. These are amazing times. It's good things happening. You can get creative like this with your green purchasing choices. All right, now we're going to look at food and agricultural products. Following the framework, question one, what is the problem? Problem is, is that agriculture is, according to the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, the largest threat to biodiversity and ecosystem function of any human activity. If you use the nitrogen for another problem, if you use the nitrogen fertilizers, synthetic, standard, and conventional farming, you'll get greater yields. But since the crops have more nitrogen in them, the crops will be more susceptible to pests. And then you'll need more pesticides. Producing and applying fertilizer contributes 16% of all green global greenhouse gases, especially nitrous oxide, which is 300 times more aggressive than carbon dioxide. Scientific American last year. Food production accounts for a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. One one tallies those from fossil fuel used in growing, preparing, and transporting food. Carbon dioxide released by clearing land for farming and pasture. Methane from rice patties and ruminant livestock. And nitrous oxide from fertilizer loss. More of this. Largest threat to biodiversity. OK, here we go. Um, a bunch of different planetary boundaries associated with purchasing agricultural products, climate change, nitrogen pollution, phosphorus pollution, biodiversity loss, land use change, toxic chemicals, health threats. The Environmental Protection Agency considers seven of the top 15 pesticides used on cotton in 2000 in the US as possible, likely, or probable known human carcinogens. How does that t-shirt feel now? Is it organic? Bet you wish it was. In 1999, a crew re-entered a cotton field about five hours after it was treated by a difficult to pronounce pesticide. And re-entry should have been prohibited for 24 hours. Seven workers sought medical treatment, and five have had ongoing health problems. There are countless stories of this type of people getting sick from pesticides, from pesticide drift. You hear of these stories in the Central Valley where they take measures inside classrooms. And, and, and it's toxic to kids. You can avoid supporting that by purchasing, by choosing green. So what is a solution? What are the real benefits? We, hear, we know about organic. But what's the real deal? Is this, does organic really provide the benefits that you think it does? So it's not only organic, it's also no-till, conservation tilling, as far as the method where seeds are drilled into the soil without plowing. Because plowing, when you plow the soil, it releases carbon. Um, combined with the use of cover crops and, and erosion control that keeps the soil, allows soil organic matter to build. The results, studies show, are considerable savings in carbon emissions. The problem is less that 10% of global farmland actually uses these types of farming methods. The impact, absolutely huge if we can get more people to actually start using these methods. Um, what are the benefits of organic? What's the evidence for greater maintenance of soil productivity and nutrient levels, for example? A long-term agricultural resource service study found that organic farming practices build soil better than chemical no-till, have more soil carbon, um, have equal or, great or better crop yields. And this is from a study called No Shortcuts in Checking Soil Health in Agricultural Research back in 2007. More evidence. Strawberry fields contain significantly higher levels of some nutrients. Zinc, boron, sodium, and iron were examples. And the organic soils also perform better through biological properties like enzyme activities, micronutrient levels, and carbon sequestration. They also had higher overall genetic diversity when, you include, when they looked at what's the microbes 
what's living in those soils. Without all those pesticides, you have a lot more. Evidence for greater soil water capacity, which is important because if we get more droughts through climate change, we're going to need some more crop resistance to drought. The Rodale Institute has been doing some incredible studies uh, on organic and no-till agriculture, and they found that soil water holding capacity and drainage capacity um, increases after organic and no-till um, because you just have greater soil aggregation and organic matter. You have more humus, which is stable organic carbon, um, sequesters carbon, and greater climate resilience directly related to soil health. And what they actually say is that solutions to dealing with changing weather patterns, like more drought, should focus on soil health. Maintaining soil organic matter and soil water holding capacity, rather than developing genetically modified drought resistant crop varieties. Ongoing UC Davis studies supported this. And in a serious drought in 1999, yields of organic soybeans were 30 bushels per acre compared with only 16 for conventional. Uh, evidence that nitrogen pollution, which causes the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, is less from uh, organic agricultural. Um, conventional agriculture relies on chemical fertilizers that reduce soil or organic matter and contaminate waterways um, because the plants just can't uptake all of the nitrogen that's applied. It's just not fine-tuned yet, leading to eutrophication and, and dead zones. Organic agriculture doesn't use permit the use of chemical fertilizers, relies on nutrient sources that tend to be less soluble and more stable, not only leaching less into waterways, but also emitting less nitrous oxide into the air. Evidence that plants are healthier. The crops themselves on organic farms. According to a study that came out just last year, organic strawberry plants showed fewer instances of post-harvest fungal rot than conventional strawberries, even though no fungicides were used. And the authors actually talked about how this is evidence that under organic, you just have natural pest resistance and from, from the greater diversity that you see in there. Evidence for healthier biodiversity, Frontiers of Ecology and the Environment, a journal of the Ecological Society of America just last year. Found they, they'd had a review, although results may vary among taxonomic groups, biodiversity is clearly enhanced on organic farms compared to conventional farms in most studies. Species richness average 30% higher on organic farms. There were positive effects. It depends on life form. Plants, arthropods, carabid beetles, other life forms, birds. There were no effects for, in, in this particular study for non-predatory arthropods or soil microorganisms. Uh, Another study back in 2005 was, was a review of 76 studies. Um, lots of benefits of organic studies in mammals were scarce, but the bottom line is, is the evidence does suggest that when you choose organic, you're benefiting biodiversity, not just yourself. Greater carbon sequestration, the International uh, Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. If world agriculture adopted best practices, we could mitigate, mitigate huge amounts of heat trap and carbon pollution. It can really make a difference. Um, even cost savings on fuel. Because in no-till, because you're not running tractors, it reduces fuel use 75% and associated emissions. We've heard the evidence for nutritional value. This study last year, organic strawberries had more antioxidants, vitamin C and phenolics, phosphorus and potassium higher than conventional. There was a little hubbub, a British controversy last year where their food standard agency argued that there isn't enough evidence to make a determination. Then other scientists came back and said, well, actually, they didn't use good meth methods in their study. The organic center countered with a big review of their own that found that organics are nutritionally superior in 145 matched pairs, especially in antioxidants. So there, is, there does seem to be some truth here of greater nutritional superiority. Organic, if it's organic, it also doesn't contain GMOs. Why does that matter? And I'll tell you, some of the stuff that I found just researching this course in this particular case is, is freaky. All right? Russian Academy of Sciences study linked Monsanto's genetically modified soy grown in 
of US soybean fields to problems in growth and reproduction. They fed hamsters this stuff for two years, over three generations. By the third generation, most genetically modified soy-eating hamsters lost their ability to reproduce, showed slower growth, and higher pup mortality. Some of the third generation had hair growing inside their mouths. Like, what, the, what is that all about? And the authors on the hair, they said this pathology may be exacerbated by elements absent in the natural food, um, you know, or, in, or genetically modified greeting, you know, ingredients or contaminants. But it's just freaky. Um, also important for avoiding genetically modified crops, the danger posed by Roundup Ready crops. Roundup Ready basically means that you can spray your crops with Roundup, and you don't have to worry about the Roundup killing your crop. So what does that do? Farmers just spray willy-nilly. Woohoo! I don't have to worry about spraying too much and killing the crops. So they, the study estimates that the distribution and use of these crops has more than doubled the use of glyphosate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, uh, to upwards of 200 million pounds in the US alone. Why does this matter? USDA scientists last year has been studying Roundup for 15 years. Guess what? Surprise, surprise. Looks like the effects of, the, of this particular pesticide are looking worse than we thought. Damage to beneficial microbes, interference with nutrient uptake by plants, reduced efficiency of nitrogen fixation, overall lower than expected plant productivity. There's also stories of serious health problems in Chile that I've seen associated with this stuff. You can avoid these by choosing organic because there's no, GMO, uh, no GMOs used. Benefits of local, and I'm just going to scan over these because I've got to keep moving. Um, but basically with local, in a conventional food system, um, a, lot, a lot more fuel, a lot more emissions than in a local food system. Local food system, conventional food system, average travel distance from the farm to your plate, 15, 18. Local, 44.6. It makes a difference when you buy local. And also tastes fresher, supports the local economy, relationships, you can know your farmer, even visit the farm. Um, meat has a huge impact. We get into this more in the course. Carbon emissions per pound of meat are much higher for beef, lowest, lower for pork and chicken, lower for fish. A problem with meat production right now is that you can have organic sustainably, you know, you can have organic, quote unquote, sustainable, grass-fed, humanely treated beef that still comes from a ranch that is overgrazed to smithereens and the biodiversity is decimated. There is no meat certification yet that says that this comes from a sustainably managed ranch. And that's a problem. Um, of course, we also look at the benefits of fair trade, shade grown, cage free, how to choose green restaurants in the class. Uh, we'll look more closely at certifications. Um, in addition to food, there are, what's the difference with organic clothing? There's GOTS is the global organic textile standard. It's the best if you're looking for organic clothing. Organic clothing, organic textiles means something a little bit different. Not just organically grown, but also organically processed into a textile. You can have an organic you can have a shirt that comes from organically grown cotton, but if it's processed using toxic dyes, it's still not a very eco-friendly product in the end. GOTS, you can look for global organic textile standard, tells you that it's been processed in a non-toxic way. Um, there's dozens of local certifications that we'll get into pesticide free. What do some of those other certifications mean? Fair trade, shade grown. More on these in the course. What else do we need to do? The last question in our framework, uh, the National Organic Program, let, uh, a report came out last year basically saying that oversight wasn't being undertaken uh, during the last presidential administration. During the years 2006 to 2008, the National Organic Program failed to promptly follow through on investigations, allowed companies to falsely advertise as organic, Sounds familiar. So again, you can have the best standards in the world, but if there's not proper oversight, 
you're not going to be guaranteed the impact that you're looking for. So this is really, really important. Um, the costs of, cer of certification are high for some small farmers. Um, so, the, so now we'll look at sustainable forest products. <coughs> Obviously a lot to cover in the food area, and there's a lot more that we get into in the course. Sustainable forest products, number one, what is the problem? When you buy wood or other products from a forest, what's the problem that you're helping to solve if you choose green? And land use and biodiversity, um, planetary boundaries are being surpassed by deforestation. Estimates of tropical forest loss per year, 6 to 12 million hectares. Not only unsustainable logging is to blame, but also illegal logging. That's something that you have to look for in wood, not only whether it's harvested sustainably, but even if it's been harvested legally. Fueling deforestation, the impacts of this, fueling deforestation, climate change, biodiversity loss, loss from indigenous cultures, illegal loggers encroaching on their land. It is estimated up to 80% of logging in Indonesia and the Brazilian Amazon and 50% in Cameroon is illegal. If you don't buy certified wood, you could be supporting some pretty bad stuff, putting money in some pretty bad people's pockets. What are the consequences? The threat of Amazon collapse. Journal Science last a couple of years ago. Amazon forests have a substantial influence on the regional and global climates. Their removal by deforestation can itself be a driver of climate change and a positive feedback on externally forced change. If enough of the Amazon is lost, people think it could become a, a savanna, which would be one of those positive feedbacks that helps advance climate change. Another problem when we lose forests, we lose their valuable ecosystem services, not just carbon uptake and mitigation of climate change, but also clean drinking water. They filter drinking water. New York City found it to actually be cheaper to protect the forests around their reservoir than to build a water filtration plant. Soil stabilization by plants. Um, after severe storms, you, we see landslides and clear cuts, for example. We don't see them if the forests are healthy and intact. Um, buffering against diseases. Pollination of crops. Crop production, in many cases, tends to be better. Production of rainfall. There are studies that have found that farms in, in Costa Rica or elsewhere that are downwind from intact forests get more rainfall than, than farms that are downwind from areas that have been deforested. The Millennium Ecosystem Assessment talks about this loss of ecosystem services. Over 60% of environmental services studied, including dynamics related to clean air and reliable water flows, are being degraded faster than they can recover. Damage to forest ecosystems is affecting everyone in the world through climate change, water scarcity, the loss of biodiversity. So the solution. What's the solution? Question two. What are the real impacts? The solution is certification, buying certified wood. It supposedly comes from a well-managed forest. The idea is that it's a market-based instrument to stimulate wise management of forests. Individual consumers select and choose good wood. And by purchasing wood from these certified, well-managed forests, you help arrest the loss of biodiversity in managed forests, giving people more incentive to manage their forests well to achieve certification and make more money by having certified wood. Does it work? Well, one problem is, is that certified forest products account for only a small fraction of wood and paper sales right now. Um, to the environment, in theory, certification protects and restores ecosystem services. I have this image of, of orangutan swinging from a certified forest. Uh. <laughs> Reduces habitat destruction and biodiversity loss. Protects watersheds and water quality. Salmon jumping everywhere in the rivers. Is that really true? Well, this type of stuff is only achieved real impact if the standards are based on real ecological knowledge of how to maintain a healthy forest landscape. And examples of some of these good forest management practices promoted by a certification that benefit ecosystems are things reduced impact logging, um, establishment of riparian buffer zones, 
alongside streams that, that, that have to be wide enough, green tree retention, maintenance of snags. A lot of uh, species nest in snags. Um, corridors. A whole bunch of very real science-based things that you should do in a certified forest. But does it really work? Well, there was a study that came out in 2009 out of, uh, I believe it was University of Florida, the effects of forest certification on biodiversity. And the key finding here was that most certified forests, systematic collection of information needed to assess the effects of management doesn't take place. Nobody's measuring whether it's actually working. Data from non-certified forests, which are needed for comparison to certified ones, are even harder to find. Ooh, ooh. The good news is that if you actually look at what the science says about the types of practices that are required by certification, you can find some benefits. So they concluded here in the study that the forest management practices associated with forest certification appear to be, be to benefit biodiversity and managed forests, although this whole thing is so new of certification that we just haven't been measuring it long enough to know whether it's actually working in certified forests specifically. Um, so their environmental findings were caution. They, 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 what they found, there's high variation in forest management practices in the effects, uh, uh, in, in just the practices themselves associated with certification. Some even at the individual stand level, some forests do a better job at complying with certification than others. High variation in response uh, uh, by and even within species. You might see species re respond, the same species respond to certification differently in one area compared to another. And it probably has to do with the health of the surrounding landscape. There's little quantitative evidence about long-term impacts and benefits. It's also new. People haven't been measuring. There are few data on which to base the conclusion. This was really striking. This is a straight quote that certified management is sustainable in terms of biodiversity conservation. Does it benefit people? Do people realize benefits from this stuff? The Rainforest Alliance put out a study, uh, economic benefits between 2001 and 2006. The Forest Stewardship Council um, certified buyers paid more money than if buyers hadn't been certified. Higher bids translated into roughly a 10% increase in revenue for the state of Pennsylvania because they had gotten their, certified, uh, their forest certified. A forest trends report also found social benefits in the tropics associated with certification. Improved management in certified areas shows new possibility for people. It gives a legitimate vehicle to promote national dialogue on issues as far as tenure, worker equity, provides a measure of good management that communities need to protect their access to a resource and freedom to management, and also provides a measure that can be a proxy for loans, payments for ecosystem services, things like offsets. Now we get to question three here. So we've looked at, OK, why is it a problem? What does the evidence say about the benefits? It's a little iffy. How can you prove it? A key aspect, as, and I think you can probably tell this now to understanding what certification is, is that I think for a lot of people there's a difference in what consumers think it is and what it actually means on the ground. And a lot of people think that it comes from forests that are being sustainably managed, but in reality the forests are only, uh, they satisfy nothing more, nothing less than the specific criteria of the certification standard. So one may question whether these standards capture sustainability. So, so then the question becomes, for question three, prove it. Who has the best criteria? And it turns out, study after study comes out saying Forest Stewardship Council is, is the eco-label to look for here. A comparison uh, suggested that their standards are the best. Uh, the biodiversity certification report last year, the effects of forest certification on biodiversity, this conclusion was based in part on the fact that they have rigorous forest management criteria, concluded that it was the best. <coughs> what else can you look at? Europe has a legality standard. Other countries have national standards, some of which are endorsed by Forest Stewardship Council. You also have, as I talked about, green procurement policies. Look, 
look at to see what your local and regional state, whatever, uh, government, green procurement, uh, what they call environmentally preferable purchasing lists recommend. Um, and then there's Forest Stewardship Council, which is the best. They certify about 100 million acres in the forest of forest in the US and Canada, founded mainly by nonprofits, um, certify on the ground forest practices, Again, standards for a given region. They have chain of custody. And that actually means that they track the chain of custody of certified wood from the forest through the manufacturing process um, to ensure that the rules of labeling are followed. The, one of the problems here that people talk, talk about, and this is an example of, how, of an area of green purchasing that we really need to improve is that FSC, while it's the best, it's generally considered the best of an imperfect bunch. It's got rigorous standards, but as I, I talked about, it's got in, in, inadequate compliance monitoring and a poor record of de detecting illegalities. There's growing concern over fraudulent use of the F F FSC logo, especially in China. The certificates have been issued to big companies with poor track records. SFI, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, was basically founded by timber companies in the US as a response to Forest Stewardship Council. They've had all sorts of ethics complaints filed against them. Um, it's a big hubbub. People talk about this classic battle between the Forest Stewardship Council and Sustainable Forestry Initiative comparing them, where uh, Sustainable Forestry Initiative pretty much is just not where it needs to be. It's gotten better. I'll admit that, but it's not even close to where it needs to be yet. You have legality certifications that we go over in the class, a whole bunch of them. Smartwood, you might have heard of that. It's not a, it doesn't mean that if it's Smartwood certified, it doesn't mean that it's come from a sustainable forest. It means that it's legal. Um, in the course, we also look at paper, how to uh, look at certification and paper calculator. Um, what else do we need to do in this category? Question four. And each week in the course, we will really focus on this as a group. What else needs to be done? We'll blog about it. Um, we need scientists to get involved here. We need to get graduate students on the ground and certified forests measuring the impact, tracking it, making sure the standards are working, and figure out how to do this better. Some resources for good wood. You have WWF has a bunch of really good forest resources, tissue scorecard, paper scorecard. There's procurement lists. We get into a lot of these and actually use them um, in the class. And now in the last couple of minutes, I'm just going to summarize and give you a couple of quick previews. Purchasing to avoid toxic chemicals. Why do we care about purchasing to avoid toxic chemicals? The book Ecological and uh, intelligence by Daniel Coleman will tell you most of the apprehension about toxic chemicals centers on the simple fact that no synthetic chemicals are integral to the body. And at a high enough level or in various combinations, their presence might not necessarily be good. But science cannot always predict what specific effects they will have in a given person. The body's biological maze is too complex. And I got to say that researching the toxic, the toxic chemicals portion of the course freaked me out the most just because there's so much uncertainty. Standards seem to be changing. What's, what's OK one year isn't good. BPA was OK. Now it's not OK. Now the replacement that, that, they, that they've been using instead of BPA, they don't think that's OK either. Damaging. These chemicals engage, engage tissue in a number of ways. Once absorbed, these chemicals can wreak havoc in any number of ways which may not be immediately obvious. It's just, it's just scary. Up to this point, assessing the tissue damage from exposure to a single chemical or class of chemicals for a limited time has been the gold standard. Test the chemical, see if it's toxic. But it tells us nothing about how it might damage tissue if exposed to it in combination with others over the course of a lifespan. This toxicologist from the Robert Ward Johnson Medical School said the standard methods of assessing safe levels of exposure to a chemical fail to address environmental realities. This is why we need to get our purchasing choices right. We teach you how in the class. Of the 80,000 defined chemical substances and technical mix 
mixes that are produced and used by industries today, each of which has all sorts of byproducts. Only about 3,000 or so far have been studied for their effects on living systems. Uh-oh. Newsweek, what's the, what's the result? Newsweek covered a report issued by the Environmental Working Group a couple of years ago. Um, and it's, it's like our body burden. Uh, and it's, a, it's, it's quite a report to read where basically this, it, they studied, I think, 40 or 50 people and they actually measured levels of toxins in their bodies. The Center for Disease Control has found 148 chemicals in Americans of all ages, including lead, mercury, dioxins, and PCBs. Others have detected antibacterial agents from liquid soaps and breast milk, infants' cord blood, and the urine of young girls. In 2005, the Environmental Working Group found an average of 200 chemicals in the cord blood of 10 newborns, including known carcinogens and neurotoxins. Studies like this are coming out, it seems, every month. How can you make purchasing choices to avoid these toxins? In the course, you will learn how to identify toxin-free products in all sorts of different business and consumer categories. And you will feel empowered to live more safely. We will also talk about purchasing choices to reduce waste, which I'll just kind of breeze through. Because we're almost out of time. When you throw something away, it remains there is no way. It remains here on planet Earth. Every bit of plastic ever made still exists. Impacts of solid waste on marine life, frontiers in ecology and the environment. Some sources estimate that plastic makes up 60% of all, 80% of all marine pollution. What is the impact? A million seabirds and 100,000 marine mammals die every year from entanglement in or consuming are dumped plastic. And who knows what is happening further down the food chain. And my favorite, how does this affect you and me? A nurdle is a little plastic core material absorbing a million times the level of uh, persistent organic pollution um, pollutants in, their sur in the surrounding waters. Nurdles become super saturated poison pills. Nurdles are little pieces of plastic. Once inside the body of a big-eyed tuna or a king salmon, these tenacious chemicals are headed directly to your dinner table. Ways to self-impose limits. Purchasing choices to eliminate waste are important. If our systems contaminate our biological mass and continue to throw away technical nutrients or render them useless, we will live in a world of limits. Why should we? Businesses are benefiting by eliminating waste. In, in, the fame, in the wonderful book, The Ecology of Commerce, Paul Hawken notes that by reformulating their products, changing processes, redesigning equipment, and recovering waste for reuse or recycling, 3M has been able to save $537 million. And this was in like 1993. During the 15 year period that it reduced its pollution by 120,000 tons, um, its wastewater by a billion gallons, and solid waste by 410 tons doesn't exactly sound like doing what's right for the environment is going to wreck the economy, does it? And there's this personal success story of zero waste purchasing. Walmart, they have these little personal sustainability projects that they have. They have teams. And this one finance manager chose to reduce waste at home, and he started recycling more and carefully trying to see how little garbage he could end up with in his trash each week. As he got more passionate about it, he started doing the same thing at work. He brought his financial skills to bear um, and really helped craft some of Walmart's current and potential waste reduction uh, strategies. So the engagement on the personal level drove him to add value for the company. So this stuff really helps. The course covers green purchasing to achieve zero waste in a bunch of different categories. And the conclusion. Um, it starts a week from Tuesday. It's in San Francisco. This is literally my first run through of this material uh, in a PowerPoint lecture. When you see this the next time, there's going to be more pictures. There's going to be less text. I will admit that this is not how I would recommend putting a PowerPoint together. <laughs> Don't do what I did here. This is, this is literally fresh off the presses. You guys are the first to see a lot of this material, and it's going to be a lot better the next time. Um, 
in the course, it's really going to focus on making you a valuable expert. We have a midterm presentation where you choose a product category based on your passions, your current job, your desired job, whatever you want. Address the four key questions. The presentations are constructively critiqued by your fellow students. You gain feedback and insight. The class is really going to be a team of change makers. We are going to push the envelope. And, and really drive progress here. The final project is to complete a green purchasing plan that you can do for your company, that you could bring into a job interview. It's going to make you the expert that your company needs, will arm you with the expertise that will help your company or land the job or promotion you're looking for. And some other benefits, we have an online author and blogging opportunity. All of your reports are going to be cataloged in a library. Of, uh, that we're going to put together an online green purchasing resource. So people who are really researching companies, companies who are researching this stuff can come here and benefit from your work. We also have a partner with the triple, partnership with the Triple Pundit. Their editor is a good friend of mine. It's a top 100,000 green business blog. Their founder is one of the co-founders of treehugger.com, where we'll be able to, if, if you want, as a student, you will be able to blog about your weekly observations blog about your, devising, your experience devising a green purchasing plan, get your name and ideas out there. So th these are opportunities that you will have by taking this course. Um, knowledge, blogging, getting your name out there, raising your profile, really becoming a valuable expert. Any questions, ideas? I have a question. Okay. You know, it's in, in response to that question, I think I'm going to tell a little story that I heard that I think that 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 kind of amused me. And in the late 1800s, there were people who were just talking about how the earth is going to go to hell because the way that the population is growing, the streets of the city are going to be covered in 10 feet of horse poop. And that hell never happened because technologies that people couldn't imagine at the time took the place of horses. And so on one level, I'd like to say energy. And I really do think energy is going to drive a new industrial revolution, and not just solar panels and wind panels, but also more efficient technologies, what we call the smart grid, which is another name for the energy internet, which is going to allow you to optimize your appliances and your home so that you, for example, your washer and dryer, you just set them to go on when electricity goes below 10 cents a kilowatt hour. So it helps save you money, it helps reduce emissions, and it helps make our country overall more energy efficient. Um, and, it's, and it's just better, it's, it's, it's more secure. Um, I think clean transport, I think some of the things that we're we're starting to hear with electric vehicle technology, for example, are really, really interesting. It's like, well, the, the sort of the, the holy grail of trans, or personal transport, at least, would be to have an electric vehicle charged by a home solar system. But what people are starting to say is that, is that even the batteries of electric cars that aren't being used can help serve as power plants. And that when you plug your car in, you can set it to say, OK, I'm, I'm going to need at least this much energy. So don't take too much that I'm not going to be able to get home. But people are actually going to be able to take energy from, the bat, the, from, your, from your car to help provide energy. Um, there's talk of big box stores putting electric charging stations in their parking lots to keep people shopping longer. And there's associated technologies. Um, so in a lot of ways, I would like to say energy. I think that there's going to be a lot of materials revolutions, bioplastics, biofuels, um, textiles. This is a really, really, really exciting time. And, and my guess is that students in this class, by running through the research needed to complete their presentations and purchasing reports, are going to find some of these answers of what's the cutting edge, what's coming next, when they start to address that question of what's really green in this purchasing category. 
and you might put yourself in a position to land the, the job of your dreams in that way. A question and maybe an idea sort of being off of that would be to have you know, one or two people in from, uh, from some of these certification or standards agencies or uh, you know, good guys or, or mm -hmm. you know, sort of in the field of, of uh, ratings and um, standards. Definitely. Definitely. We're going to have guest speakers in the course. And I've been in touch with the good guide folks as well as scientific certification systems so far. So first of all, I love this because as far as jobs in the future, I actually work for an environmental organization on mm -hmm. public policy reform. And sustainable field because the world is complex and you'll always need environmental advocates doesn't pay well though. So <laughs> keep that in mind. But I had a, I had a lot of questions a lot of this are the things we struggle with all the time in the policy arena. And if I have to pick one, the interest of time, um, is something you talked about at the beginning about the complexity of weighing, when you're trying to define what's green, weighing sometimes the contradictory issues that will come up. And my favorite pet peeve, and it's, it's a good way to ask my question, is the whole idea of mercury containing energy efficient light bulbs. In California, we do not have coal burning power plants. We have, and I work on mercury contamination in water. One light bulb can cause a lot of environmental harm. So actually, in our office, we won't buy them. You know, we'll buy, we hate it, but we did turn off the lights, but we use incandescent lights. Mm -hmm. And the point, the question is, as you're weighing this, because the world isn't perfect and we're always going to have to do these give and take decisions, how do you get people thinking in terms of all this excitement about the potential out there to say, okay, while we're trying to solve a problem, let's look at the whole big picture. So mercury shouldn't have even been in the tool chip for that problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, how, how do, you, do you have any thoughts on that, um, on how to motivate people to, to look beyond the question they're trying to answer? Well, well, I, I think what, what the, the framework that the way that I present this framework and the way that I look at it were especially question four is like what else needs to be done um, really helps identify issues just like that and getting mercury out of CFLs or going to LEDs immediately becomes a solution and, and then you just look to the technology and you see what makes more sense is it easier just to ramp up LEDs or to get mercury out of CFLs I know that with CFLs, there's enough problems with people just not liking their light. You know, I, 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 my wife won't let me replace, even with warm CFLs, our dimmables in our living room because she said it, she doesn't like the light. And she wants it to be warmer and, and more orange. So, I mean, I dim it as low as possible when I use those incandescents. But it's, it would seem to me that that's an issue that's going to take care of itself in the long run. In the short run, my personal concern is climate change. I make sure that I handle CFLs and, and bring them to Home Depot or wherever when I'm done with them. And I have a little special separate box for them in my electronics recycling bin so that when I you know, throw another cell phone or whatever in, in, in there, that it doesn't break any of the light bulbs. But um, to answer your question specifically, I would say that's where on, on one level, on a technical level, life cycle analysis comes in and, and, and can give you a measurable impact. But on a personal level, it depends on what you really care about. You know, in my case, I'm particularly concerned about climate change. I'm really freaked out by mercury and toxic pollution. But I think that you know, as far as you know, the long term of the biosphere, climate change is something that has the potential to really bring the human population way, way down a lot faster than the mercury pollution in toxic bulbs. I think that the toxic bulbs uh, will be taken care of. My guess is in the next decade or two as things switch over to LEDs. I just hope that LEDs don't end up with some kind of similar problem. Yeah, they have. Yeah. Are they half? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, uh, because of the circuit board. Oh, right, right. Circuit board is presumed. Okay, right, right. 
problem. Okay. So, they were even talking. Wow. Because, uh, I work in a waste industry. Okay. I work in a solid waste and hazardous waste. So what's the solution? No solution. No solution yet. You know, that's why I want to add one thing into your triple bottom line. Mm -hmm. It's true on that. But one thing that's missing there is called political. Mm -hmm. Of course. It should be quadruple bottom line. Mm -hmm. Because the, the politics, in, you know, change everything. Mm -hmm. It changed the, the behavior, behavior of, you know, consumers. It changed the social norm of thinking. For example, like, you know, you were talking about the mercury lamps. Same problem. Mm -hmm. Don't you, like, you know, with the, with the new law that came out for federal 2012, uh, all commercial buildings have to replace their parts and light or energy saving lamps. Mm -hmm. which is California pushed one year earlier. This year, all commercial, which is tier one, mm -hmm. all commercial buildings has to be replaced with energy saving. 2012, all residential in California must replace energy saving lights. Even your light lights. It sounds like we need some kind of brilliant inventor to come up with a way to capture the mercury yeah, out, of, out the, of CFLs. The boom of recycling, quote, quote, recycling of mercury. Mm -hmm. in California because they do in some other states. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a problem with the politics. Yep. California set one standard, but then when they ship outside of California for full quote recycling, the definition with that state is totally different. And that's what I run into all the time. So and, and, that's, and that's where, our, and, and, I'll, and I'll tell you something funny about this. The next, that's why when you, when you saw at the beginning of the class, communication specialist is a scientist What's driven me towards communication over the last few years is exactly that, is how do you actually motivate people to do this stuff? How do you deal with the politics? And because whether it's climate change or toxic pollution, the politics always ends up being the problem. And that's why you know, sometimes it can seem uh, pretty daunting. You know, what kind of world are we headed towards? And that's what also why I like to work with friends in the music business, because I do my best and then I have fun. <laughs> and that's important to keep that kind of balance. Okay. Good, que good, good questions, good points. And I, I, would, I would love for you to take the class and, and do some work on that and, and, and share those ideas with us. So it's, it's important points. Cool. Yeah, because I'm working on two legislation right now. One is exactly the lamps you just brought up. This is actually the draft language uh, we're going to talk about tomorrow um, C uh, with CPSC. We need, maybe, maybe California needs to have some kind of crowdsourcing competition. Of some, somebody's got an idea out there of how to deal with all this stuff. I don't, I don't know what, what the answer is going to ultimately be, but that's, it is. It's a huge one. So what California is trying to do is like adopt the European Union. Right, right, right. Right, right. To reach standards. Right. But there's no way they can do that because. The politics. Well, it's not. You cannot because we deal with, we're dealing with only one state out of 50 states. And, you know, the, the actual standard in California, just like I mentioned in the scenario earlier, whatever you define in California, that doesn't apply to outside of California. So people can start avoiding doing business in California. Or if they do, they can get the full cool exemption because they only do that transportation only to the port and then get the hell out of here. Right. I think we have time for maybe two more questions. You got a question. Oh, I sort of a question, it's more of a comment to follow on that. I, I work at an NGO that deals a lot with um, sustainability and electronics and um, we've been really involved with this whole ET eco label. I can tell you lots about it. And um, anyway when in, in some of the discussions about, you know, mercury in the backlighting of displays um, you know, a lot of the companies would respond by saying, oh, well, we take care of that issue, we're moving to LEDs, but then when we ask them what's in the LEDs, they're like, we have no idea. And so, you know, even talking to them about, well, maybe you should start to know what's in your products, and they, right. they would not actually um, agree that they should, they should know what chemicals are in their product. They were like, just give us a restricted substance list, and that's all we care about. And I was like, we're never going to get past the problem unless you start, you know, analyzing what you're going to move to, what yeah. the alternatives are, and 
um, really get a better understanding of, you know, instead of doing this uh, regrettable substitution, you know, we, we really need to push them to um, ha have a better understanding of what's in their products and, you know, get the testing done and, and all of those things. A, l a lot of the issues that we see today, and this is something that I found like with greenwashing, which is false green claims, for example, and with, a, with an issue like that, is that if they had a good sustainability person, a good scientist or expert on board, they would probably <coughs> look into that more carefully. Is that the rise of green business has happened faster than the involvement of experts. And green business really needs scientists to get involved. Business pays well. Get involved. Help drive product development. Help be there at that point in product design so you can ask those questions. You know, and, that, and that's, one, that's why I really, really encourage sustainability experts, scientists, to get involved with business. You're the ones who are the scientists are the ones who are the experts who know what's going on with this stuff who ask these questions. When I work with with this mattress client, for example, I probably know more about the I'm pretty sure actually the, about the, the mattresses and the materials than the CEO. And I've only been there for a few months. And already I've helped put out a whole bunch of different fires. Um, deal with some ma product materials choice issues, language issues. It's endless. But I think really the solution is, is, and that's really why this line of work is so important too, and, and this type of course is so important, is that companies need people with this type of expertise to ask those types of questions. Uh, what's in LEDs? You know, is there any way around that? Is there a substitute that's OK? Is there a brominated flame retardant in the circuit board? Can we do it without the brominated flame retardant? You know, and, and to push and be there. Um, it, it, it really needs to happen. I mean, we are on the leading edge of a great transformation in society. It's really, really just beginning. And the types of issues that, that you talk about really just require having people working in these companies, asking those questions from the beginning. So that when they're designing a CFL, mercury in that, not such a good idea. From the beginning of product development, you have the right people in there making those points, asking those questions, we can avoid these problems. I just wanted to add one thing. The good news is um, that California actually isn't trying to reinvent the beach. The beach is already there. It's actually, if it's done right, and that, of course, always the million dollar question, it's actually trying to push alternative investment. And so that was the green, that's what the green test You're right. You have to have the experts in there that know how to do that, and that is a lot. That's it's a whole new field. Yeah. It really is. Well, thank you, John. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. And I hope to see you guys you in the class. <laughs>